thank you all for inviting me to speak. Um, the title of my talk is The Do-It-Yourself Combat Manual for Beating Prostate Cancer. Um, before I get started, I'd like to dedicate this talk to all of those men who we have lost to prostate cancer over the many years, friends, sons, soulmates, husbands, and fathers. I know that you are deeply missed. Um, before I speak, I always have to give disclosure. Uh, I myself and Mayo Clinic have received licensing payments for PD-1 and PDL one immunotherapy-related intellectual properties. And just to warn you, and much against the people that invited me to give this talk, the presentation runtime for my talk is going to be about 17 hours and 39 minutes. I'm just joking, so don't get too upset. So before we talk about prostate cancer, I think it's worthwhile to go over the stats. Um, prostate cancer in 2020 was the most common non-skin malignancy in men. Approximately a quarter of a million men were diagnosed with prostate cancer in 2020. About 34,000 patients died of prostate cancer in 2020. I think this is comparable to the death rate that is seen with breast cancer for women. An interesting fact is about 90,000 men actually fail treatment for prostate cancer every year. That's about a third of the patients that undergo diagnosis of prostate cancer in the United States. And what's really interesting is most of these men who fail treatment either fail prostate cancer surgery or prostate cancer radiation therapy, and then later go on to develop various forms of advanced prostate cancer. What's also very interesting to me is I was hired in 2002 to work at Mayo Clinic. And at that time, I was told that the number one reason a patient comes to Mayo Clinic urology is because their PSA is rising after they were treated for prostate cancer. So that was the number one indication for coming to Mayo Clinic at the time. And I have to squeeze this in because I'd get fired if I didn't mention it. Mayo Clinic is the number one hospital in the nation, and Mayo Clinic Urology is the number one urology department uh, of all urology departments in the United States. At any rate, when I was hired in 2002, we really only had three forms of treatment for prostate cancer that included surgery, radiation therapy, and hormone therapy. Since that time, there's been an explosion of agents and technologies and approaches for managing prostate cancer. And, you know, just right off the bat, you would get pretty excited if you saw all of this progress. But there is a curious thing about all of this. Despite the fact that we have all these new inventions and exciting approaches to treat prostate cancer, death rates are remaining fairly sta stagnant or static they really haven't been dropping the way we would like to see them drop. So you have to ask yourself the question. I mean, we have all these new toys to play with. What the heck is going on? Why aren't we solving the problem of prostate cancer? So when we go back to all these new technologies and everything, we ask ourselves the question, you know, why are people um, still dying of prostate cancer in the United States of America? I talked to some CEOs and people that run the insurance companies, and they told me that there is a problem. One of the companies informed me that they did a study of 44,000 men, and of the 44,000 men treated for prostate cancer in the United States, 2,200 of these men had different pathways of treatment. So when you look at this, you might say, wow, that's a lot of pathways of treatment. And it may raise the question, does anyone really know which, which way is up? So if we're confused as physicians and healthcare providers as to how to treat prostate cancer, I can only imagine that people that have recently been diagnosed with prostate cancer must be completely confused and blown away by all the information that is out there with regards to managing prostate cancer. So to me, this is a lot like the story, A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. The goals of my presentation are to review diagnostic approaches for advanced prostate cancer, to review available treatments for advanced prostate cancer, 
to review the hottest new things that you see in the newspapers and read in the magazines, discuss the importance of logical sequence of treatment. And finally, most importantly, I want to empower patients to be able to direct their own care so that they can avoid dangerous pitfalls and optimize their outcomes. So before we talk about prostate cancer, I always like having a prostate cancer 101 course to make sure everyone's on the same page. We know that some people are beginners, other people are experts. However, we also know that some of the beginners are actually very logical and expert, whereas some of the experts are really not experts. They're more like beginners. So my favorite analogy is prostate cancer is like a dandelion. It grows, it blooms, and it can throw seeds that can start growing elsewhere. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about are questions that are asked to me by patients. So I just want to go over these very basic things. Prostate cancer forms in the prostate, and usually PSA goes up when prostate cancer forms. After it's grown for a while, it can throw seeds to the rest of the body, and we call these metastasis. Or as I was working on my talk, I thought, metastasis seeds. These are seeds of prostate cancer. These seeds can all produce PSA as well. So PSA doesn't just come from primary tumor, it comes from metastases. Normal prostate makes PSA, prostate cancer makes PSA, Prostate cancer can produce these metastases, and the metastases can all make PSA. In addition to this, metastases are called prostate cancer wherever they land. So if they're in the bone, that's prostate cancer. If they're in the lung, that's prostate cancer. It doesn't change to bone cancer or lung cancer when the cancer starts growing in a different part of the body. The other thing that confuses patients, metastases can be present from the time you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, or metastases can develop after your first therapy. So for instance, you may have your prostate taken out, but later on, these metastases may show up. And the reason that happens is tiny seeds are already planted at all these different locations, and they can turn into mass metastases over time. And of course, there are some exceptions to some of the things I said, and we will cover some of those exceptions as we move through the talk. Finally, one thing that I'd like to go over clearly is the concept of hormone-sensitive prostate cancer versus hormone-insensitive prostate cancer. Hormone-sensitive prostate cancer is a form of prostate cancer that if you treat it with hormone therapy like Lupron, Eligard, Zolodex, uh, Casedex, whatever, the expectation is you will lower testosterone in the body and the tumor will shrink away and then the PSA will go down. In contrast, hormone resistant prostate cancer is a situation where you give hormone therapy, Lupron, Eligard, Zolodex, whatever, and testosterone is down, but the cancer keeps growing and the PSA goes up. This is the definition of hormone-resistant prostate cancer. So that's the basic vocabulary with regards to prostate cancer. And now we can start talking about how to try to beat the disease. So I have certain tenets that I would like to share with patients, and these are my beliefs. I think patients should realize that they are in control of your own health care. You are in control of your own health care. I think you should also understand that if you don't aim to beat your cancer, you will lose the battle. So I think it's very important to always try to think of how you can beat this disease. Another very important thing is do not start any form of therapy until you fully understand what is going on with your disease. This is very important. I believe that everyone should obtain PET imaging of their cancer to plan their treatments. Your cancer is not the same as the guy down the street. So if Anthony says he's got this, doesn't mean that you want to treat it that way. If Joey says he's got this, doesn't mean you want to treat it that way. 
Another thing is, as soon as you get a scan of your disease, you should stratify it into local, focal, zonal, or diffuse disease. I also think that you should plan on multiple concurrent therapies, simultaneous therapies for treatment when you know where your cancer is. The only exception to that is if you have one spot of cancer and you want to see if you can kill it cleanly, like a solitary metastasis, you don't need to start other therapies. I do believe that you should not exclude chemotherapy as an, as an early component of treatment. I think this is a very important thing. We'll talk about more later. Do not trust your PSA alone. You should combine it with imaging, preferably in the form of PET imaging, to stay abreast of what's going on with your cancer. You cannot rely on PSA alone. And I'll give you examples of that as we move forward. Always push for a curative outcome. Do not accept the statement, oh, we can only palliate your disease. And finally, I think you should question your doctor. If he does, or he or she does not agree with your treatment goals, I think you got to go over that. And you have to be certain that your doctor is in line with what your expectations are. And this is, you know, kind of um, maybe a snarky comment, but the reality is the fact that you may actually know more about optimal treatment of your prostate cancer than the doctor who's taking care of you. That's just the reality. Doctors are overworked. They don't necessarily cone down on prostate cancer. So you need to take ownership of your own treatment plan. So in two of my tenants, I talked about PET imaging. So now we're going to talk a little bit about PET imaging. So why is PET so important, so darn important? Why does Quan think this is important? Well, you cannot understand what you cannot see. You cannot fix what you don't understand. Therefore, you cannot fix what you cannot see. It's like a theorem. Just like in geometry, they had theorems, remember? So... Why is this so important? Standard of care imaging includes bone scans, CT scans, MRIs. These are all great scans, but they have limitations. They can only see big problems. A lot of times your PSA has to get very high before you can see the cancer. A lot of times you have to get multiple scans just to cover the whole body, and you should always try to cover the whole body. A lot of these scans are very slow to depict changes in response to therapy. A lot of times these scans cannot differentiate between what's alive and what's a dead cancer or what does, what's alive or dead tumor. These scans are very expensive with poor yield. A lot of times these scans will lead to inaccurate understanding of the situation and incorrect clinical assessment of the response to therapy. So, in conclusion, these are great scans, CT, MRI, and bone scans, but they provide limited information for overall planning and assessment of prostate cancer treatment. In other words, or by analogy, I mean, honestly, would Bezos or Branson or Musk travel into space with old technology? The answer is no, of course not. They would not. So you should not use old technology to plan your strategy for treating your prostate cancer, okay? So now we talk a little bit about um, PET imaging. And after this section, you'll know more about PET imaging than most physicians know. PET imaging is like weather Doppler radar. It shows you where the storm is brewing inside your body. When I talk about PET imaging, I'll be showing you images like these. These are colorized images, and a lot of the color on these scans are normal organs. So sometimes liver shows up, bowel, kidneys, spleen, these are all normal. But these PET images can also show you serious abnormalities like a metastasis from prostate cancer. So here's a metastasis growing inside the bone of this gentleman's pelvis and it is bright red, which means it is an intense and very aggressive form of prostate cancer that has spread to the bone. If it's not that aggressive, it will has, have less color or less bright color associated with it. So this is one representative representation of PET scanning. 
Another representation that I totally love is this translucent man look. This is basically the PET image being injected into the vein where you can see it right there and that spreads out throughout the body. And you can see the liver and the kidneys, but you don't see any other structures from the body because this is just the PET agent in the body. And what I like about this image is that you can do this. You can spin these images around and you can look at the cancer inside the body, like these big lymph nodes that are inside that gentleman's pelvis. That was a depiction of the cancer in three dimension inside the translucent body. It's fascinating. So why is PET imaging so important for prostate cancer? It provides early depiction of disease. It more accurately depicts extent of disease than serum PSA values. So I'll give you an example of that. Two boys named Sue. So both of these gentlemen have a PSA of approximately 30 something, 33 versus 36. This gentleman has a tiny amount of prostate cancer in his prostate area. This gentleman is riddled with prostate cancer all over his body. So here's a circumstance where PSAs look same, but you have a very different representation of disease in the body. This illustrates how important it is to get a PET scan. It shows you where your disease is and how much is there and how active it is. And of course, the two boys named Sue is a reference to the song, A Boy Named Sue, which was by Johnny Cash, who is one of my favorite performers, okay? Another reason PET imaging is so important, it instantaneously clarifies the most logical approach to treatment. We'll cover that in the next section. It rapidly indicates response to therapy. So here's an example of a response to therapy. You don't need a PhD or an MD or any kind of special degree to see that this cancer is dying with treatment. It's that easy. Whereas if you look at a CT scan, it, you could scratch your, scratch your head, rub your eyes. It's hard to see what's going on there. Same with MRI. You don't know if the cancer is alive or is it dead? Is it getting better? Is it getting bigger? You don't know. So that shows you what PET can do for interpreting response to therapy. Finally, I think one of the most important things about PET imaging, it empowers patients to know what the heck is going on with their cancer, and it keeps doctors honest. If a doctor cannot point to your cancer and tell you exactly what is going on, then I think that there's fundamentally a problem, and it's hard to assign logical treatment at that point. Related to this, I think it's your responsibility as a patient to always review your scans with your doctor so that you have a full understanding of your disease. So the next part of this is PET scanning, what is new? So we had our first PET scanner approved by the FDA. It was a choline PET scanner in 2012, and our machine was actually fired up in 2005. So we've been doing PET scans for a long time here at Mayo Clinic. In May of 2016, the Axuman PET scan was approved for commercial use out in the community. In December of 2020, the Gallium PSMA PET scan was invented and rolled out uh, and approved by the FDA. And then finally, uh, in May of 2021, the F-18 PSMA PET scan was approved by the F FDA. So there are now four PET scans out there with FDA approval. The difference between the scans are as follows. Choline PET scan and Axuman scan are called metabolic PET scans. These things are based on molecules that the cancer consumes and swallows as part of the metabolic activity of the cancer. So the cancer swallows them and they light up, kind of like a toad lighting up when it swallows a firefly, just like that. Marker-targeted PET imaging is PSMA PET imaging, gallium or F18. And the way these things work is the fact that prostate cancer cells have on their surface prostate-specific membrane antigen. And the agent that is shot into the body then binds to this surface marker 
on the surface of the prostate cancer cell. So these are marker targeted PET imaging agents, these two, the PSMA scans. So the minute you open the Wall Street Journal or any kind of media out there, there's this big fight that's brewing. And the question is, which PET scan is better? Every time there's a new PET scan, that one's better than the old one, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, which PET is better, C11, PSMA PET, or Axuman PET? So at Mayo Clinic, we do about 40, 42, 4,500 PETs a year just of choline. We also now have PSMA PET scanning available. And on top of it, we see so many patients that they drag in Exuman scans, PSMA scans from the outside. So we've had every opportunity to compare these forms of scanning. And here's the answer to which one's best. For some patients, PSMA PET scan works better than choline. For some patients, choline PET scan works better than PSMA. For some patients, both of the scans function equivalently. I was not able to do the same kind of comparisons with Axuman because the representations are a little bit different. But the bottom line is that sometimes these scans work for some people and sometimes they don't work for other people. So in final words about PET scanning, what I would like to say is PET imaging can see cancer seven years before st standard imaging. We did that calculation, we published it. PET imaging can find first spots of cancer around the PSA of zero to 2.0 nanogram per ml, very early. Arguments about superiority of a PET scan are stupid. Any PET imaging is better than no PET imaging. That's the most important takeaway lesson from this talk. Multiple forms of PET imaging will ultimately be better than only a single form of PET imaging in the future. All forms of PET imaging have variable ability to see prostate cancer in a given individual. The one advantage of PSMA PET imaging is that it has the advantage of su su suggesting treatability by isotopes such as 177 PSMA lutetium or 225 actinium. And we'll talk more about that toward the end of the talk. Finally, I think experience with interpreting PET scans is probably much more important than the type of PET scan you get. So you got to go somewhere where they have a lot of experience reading PET scans and interpreting PET scans because it's not that easy to interpret a PET scan. So you need experienced people to look over the scans for you.